All right. Uh, good afternoon to those of you tuning in uh, from California or elsewhere on the West Coast. Uh, good evening to those of you further east in North America. And uh, good morning to those of you just waking up in Taipei or elsewhere in East Asia. Uh, I am Karis Templeman. I'm the program manager of the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region at the Hoover Institution. And uh, it is my delight to welcome our audience today to this event on defending media freedom in Taiwan. Uh, today, we are going to be discussing the state of Taiwan's media environment with three expert panelists, all joining us today from Taipei. Uh, we have uh, Cedric Alviani of Reporters Without Borders in Taipei. We have um, Chunling Huang, uh, Hong of National Taiwan University, uh, where she's a professor of journalism. And we have Eric Huang of the National Policy Foundation, where he's a non-resident uh, research fellow. Uh, I will introduce them in more detail in uh, just a bit. Uh, but first, I'd like to take a few moments uh, to describe the motivation for this event and uh, to place it in some broader context for our audience. Uh, so the impetus for our discussion about media issues in Taiwan was a decision that was announced in Taiwan about four months ago uh, in November of 2020. Uh, Taiwan's National Communications Commission, uh, which is roughly akin to the, to the Americans in the audience, to the Federal uh, Communications Commission, the FCC, uh, decided not to renew the broadcast license of one of Taiwan's most watched television channels, uh, the news station Zhongtian, or in English, CTI TV. Uh, this channel's news coverage was in general quite critical of the government of President Tsai Ing-wen and her party, the Democratic Progressive Party, and uh, quite supportive of the opposition, the Guomindang or KMT. Uh, and it, along with its sister station, CTV, is the most China-friendly channel on uh, Taiwan's, of the various 24-hour news channels, and there are many in Taiwan, uh, on air in Taiwan. So this decision had the effect of forcing a TV station that was stridently critical of the government uh, to vacate the space it had occupied on Taiwan's TV channel uh, spectrum. Uh, and that occurred on December 11th. Um, so, uh, since then, CTI TV has been off, uh, has, has not had a place on the, the broadcast spectrum in Taiwan. They are broadcasting, and I believe they are broadcasting this event as well, uh, via YouTube. Um, and so uh, while they have not been silenced, they are no longer occupying prime real estate on Taiwan's uh, television uh, channel spectrum. Uh, so. Uh, to tee this conversation up, I'd like to make three observations about uh, Taiwan's media environment uh, and put this in a bit of comparative perspective. Uh, so first, Taiwan has a reputation, uh, generally well-deserved, I think, as a bastion of free speech and freedom of the press in Asia. Reporters Without Borders last year ranked Taiwan uh, 42nd in the world, which may not sound great, until you realize that puts it at the top of the table in Asia, ahead of even Japan, and well ahead of its sibling rival in South Korea. Um, and uh, in contrast to events in Hong Kong, and certainly in the People's Republic of China on the mainland, um, Taiwan looks like, uh, Taiwan is a real bright spot uh, in terms of media freedom in Asia. Um, and so, um, the decision to take a TV channel off uh, the spectrum is actually uh, quite a departure from Taiwan's traditional laissez-faire approach to regulation. Since uh, it was created in 2006, the National Communications Commission has actually never before refused to renew a license uh, for a station. It has fined stations for their coverage, uh, for sloppy reporting, uh, for misleading claims, uh, but it has never before denied a license to one. So this decision represents a potential inflection point, uh, from my view, where the NCC is using its power to regulate 
broadcast media more frequently and potentially more aggressively to police content and reporting. Um, and as I noted, that's striking because Taiwan has traditionally had a very laissez-faire, uh, we might even say libertarian approach to the regulation of media. Um, yeah, there is no equivalent in Taiwan to uh, the National Communications Commission in the print media world, for instance. Since 1999, uh, there is no need to, to get a license to publish a newspaper or a, a political magazine. And so Taiwan, uh, one of the great achievements of Taiwan's transition to democracy was just how, how free and open its media sphere became. Um, second, the second point I'll note is that Taiwan has been at the forefront of uh, expansion of influence of the People's Republic of China under the Chinese Communist Party. And its media industry was an early and very important target of the CCP's efforts to shape the narrative about China. Um, many countries, industries, and companies have been a target of CC pressure to change their public statements, their behavior uh, towards China. And in fact, there is one uh, influence campaign ongoing against the BBC in the UK right now. Um, but Taiwan got this pressure early and often, and it has been a, a significant target well before the rest of the world uh, kind of woke up to the threat of Chinese influence operations and the threat to the freedom of media. Um, in particular, there were deep concerns in Taiwan in the 2018 and 2020 election campaigns. 2018 was a, a comprehensive local elections. 2020 was for the president and the legislature. There were deep concerns that the CCP was trying to use China-friendly media in Taiwan to bolster its favored candidates and to divide and discredit the groups that it did not like. Um, I shared those concerns and I, I, I don't think I'm alone at Stanford and at Hoover in sharing those concerns. Um, and the chief suspect in this campaign was and remains none other than CTI TV and its sister channel CTV, which I should note remains on the air. Um, so a large part of the NCC's public justification for its decision to uh, not to renew CTI TV's license is related to these concerns about misleading or unbalanced political coverage and a lack of transparency in its editorial and ownership structure, during, especially during these two political campaigns. Um, the third point I will note is that the NCC itself uh, was created to be a nonpartisan independent commission. It was modeled roughly on the way that independent commissions are set up in the United States. But a lot like the United States, it is structured in a way that doesn't necessarily preserve that political independence very well, at least from looking from an outsider's perspective, the way that its members are nominated and appointed and confirmed uh, does not seem to suggest it has total independence. In fact, um, all commissioners who ruled on the CTI TV case were appointed by a DPP premier and confirmed by a DPP majority in the legislature. So uh, the way the NCC is structured, um, the premier appoints, the legislature confirms, uh, and they serve four-year terms. And so uh, unless there is rotation uh, between political parties in the presidency, in the executive branch, then you end up with an NCC that is full of appointees from one political party ruling on cases like this. Uh, and this was also true, not only under a DPP government, but previously under a KMT government during the Ma Ying-chou era. Um, and so the structure of the NCC, particularly if it becomes more powerful and more aggressive about policing uh, content and reporting in Taiwan, I think uh, is uh, particularly problematic. And I'd invite uh, the panelists to comment on this issue as well. Um, so with that broader set of perspectives laid out, uh, I'll turn now to some uh, introductions. Um, <clears throat> uh, our panelists uh, were very fortunate today to have three experts on this issue. Uh, we'll go in order of the program. Uh, we'll start with uh, Cedric Albiani, who, as I mentioned, is 
the head of the East Asia Bureau of the Reporters Without Borders in Taipei. Uh, I'm especially glad that we have him here today, uh, in part because RSF uh, issued a statement on the CTITV decision uh, that was generally supportive of the NCC's uh, uh, decision not to renew the license. And so I'd like to hear him explain uh, why uh, RSF was supportive of that position. Um, this is an unusual uh, position for a champion of media freedom to take, I would think. Um, second, we will hear from Professor Hong Zhengling, uh, who is not only a professor of the Graduate School of Journalism at National Taiwan University, she is also a former uh, commission member of the NCC. And so uh, she is well positioned to talk about some of the internal challenges, uh, and the real kind of complicated issues in attempting to regulate broadcast television in Taiwan. Um, <clears throat> she is no longer in that role, so she can speak freely as a private citizen as well. I should note that uh, she's speaking in her private capacity. Uh, and finally, we have Eric Huang from the National Policy Foundation, which is a KMT-linked think tank. Uh, he is also a former uh, spokesperson for the KMT's International Affairs Department. And particularly important and relevant to this conversation, he uh, has some media experience as well. He's, he served as a reporter and translator for the uh, oldest English language newspaper in Taiwan, the China Post. Uh, and so he'll provide some reflections as well on this decision and on the broader kind of state of media freedom in Taiwan. So uh, without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Cedric. Thank you, Carissa. Yeah. So Taiwan ranked 43rd out of 180 in our index. This is second best in Asia. And uh, this is also two spots ahead of the USA. So actually, there's no question uh, in our assessment that uh, freedom of the press uh, is uh, generally enforced in Taiwan. Uh, there is indeed no uh, government interference, like direct, direct political pressure. And whenever it happened in the past, it was not tolerated at all uh, by the public. Uh, however, Although the media are uh, basically free in Taiwan, there are still some major problems remaining. Uh, I, I would tell you the three major, uh, very strong political polar polarization between the two uh, major political parties camps, uh, a very strong tendency to sensationalism and uh, a global pursuit of profit in the media sector uh, that uh, we believe hinder the role of journalism in, in Taiwan, of journalism to truly empower the citizens and allow them to access unbiased information. Uh, journalism is supposed to help uh, the citizens to uh, make educated decisions. And if it does not uh, fulfill this role, then this is a problem. Uh, the uh, problem of quality of the media in Taiwan is, in our uh, assessment, one of the last remaining big problems that uh, hinder the Taiwanese democracy from being a true exemplar, uh, not only in Asia, but actually in the world, which it could be. Uh, uh, according uh, to recent studies, uh, Taiwan has the lowest, one of the lowest rates of trust in the media third position out of 40 uh, surveyed countries and with an average of 20 percent this is extremely low for a democracy um, and over the past decades the Taiwanese authorities no matter uh, the politics yeah no matter the political camp have not really acted to solve the problem which now is turning, and uh, it is widely recognized uh, in Taiwan, which now is turning into a major threat because, of course, the Chinese regime is exploiting uh, this weakness and trying to uh, impact on uh, the Taiwanese politics uh, through the media. So 
media owners in Taiwan have no interest in changing the system. First, because they somehow make politicians due to the power they have. Uh, secondly, uh, because after politicians are uh, in power, it's of course very awkward for them to try and uh, and and you know take back part of this power. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Uh, and for this reason, Reporters Without Borders has been calling several times uh, the Taiwanese government and the Taiwanese re re legislators to better regulate the sector, not to control it, of course, but to make sure it is not the law of the jungle. Because so far, we're in the situation of total freedom, which actually does not benefit uh, the Taiwanese citizens, does not benefit the Taiwanese public. We're in a situation where media owners are abusing their freedom, not only in the case of CTI, but generally, uh, no matter their political orientation. And this does not uh, happen for the benefit of the Taiwanese public. This is a threat to the Taiwanese democracy. So now, yeah, maybe talking one word uh, on the uh, decision of NCC not to renew the CTI license. Uh, Caris, you mentioned uh, Reporters Without Borders uh, assessment uh, was quite unusual. It is not Reporters Without Borders. Uh, it's an international uh, NGO that has to speak the same way, no matter the uh, country. No matter the region uh, it is uh, it, it is talking about so actually what we said about taiwan uh, could have been said in other countries uh, the point is what is the reporters without models mandate it is freedom of information information means facts it means journalistic facts it doesn't mean freedom of opinion it doesn't mean freedom of expression if CTI had been an opinion channel, let's say a political channel, a religious channel that is stating its opinion, I do not think NCC would have had any problem with uh, letting them operate. The problem is that uh, CTI is uh, a news channel. A news channel is supposed to report facts, not report the opinion of its owner not report the opinion of a political camp. It is supposed to report facts. So when uh, it is shown that it has repeatedly failed its mission to report factual information or that it is disguising information to serve a political camp, it is somehow a propaganda channel. It is not a news channel anymore. So uh, this is what is very important to underline. We are not talking about a decision that was taken, I believe, uh, from the uh, NCC in order to gag an opinion channel. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is a sanction that touches a news channel that is supposed to report news, factual information. Now, of course, uh, NCC has clearly uh, failed that mission several times repeatedly, and somehow the freedom of the press is always invoked in Taiwan as an excuse uh, for uh, going against uh, the basic ethical standards of journalism. This is not, uh, this, this is not journalism. So I will insist, and, and I, I will be done uh, on a very few points. Uh, first, press freedom does not mean absence of regulation. It is necessary in every democracy that the uh, media sector is regulated uh, for the benefit of the public, just like any other economic sector. Otherwise, it's the law of the jungle. Otherwise, it gives all power to the media owners. And this is not acceptable. Secondly, the review made by NCC is not illegitimate per se. Uh, first, it's legal, it's planned by the, by the law. Secondly, they, they have the option to renew or not renew channels. And if they never uh, exert this option, then uh, I do not think they are doing their job. Uh, so it is not illegitimate per se, and it is normal that democracies 
have ways to protect themselves against propaganda, uh, against uh, some uh, actions that might potentially undermine them. So now, what is regrettable is that the decision made by NCC was uh, made, to, in my sense, a very casual way. Uh, NCC did not provide a complete set of evidence uh, to uh, substantiate uh, its uh, accusations. Th there were documents provided, but it was not uh, a complete set of evidence. And this is regrettable. And also, as it is a first time decision, we could expect NCC to use the same standards in the future for other channels, and especially channels that do not belong to the same political camp. And uh, what Reporters Without Borders said is not that NCC is right or that the government should, uh, should, should, should uh, prevent CTI from, uh, from existing. And actually, as a matter of fact, it didn't happen because CTI still exists. Uh, there was no crackdown. There was no shutdown uh, of CTI's operations. It's just a license uh, to, uh, to, 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 to uh, emit on a certain medium that was, uh, that, that, that was not renewed. Uh, so we believe the Taiwanese government and NCC should uh, use a set of standards that is similar no matter uh, the channel. That's very important. And currently, all Taiwanese governments, no matter their camp, share the responsibility for the lack of, re of respect of journalism standards, of ethical standards. Uh, so we do not believe uh, DPP has done better than the Kuomintang uh, with this regard. We believe it is about time for the Taiwanese democracy to protect itself. And for this, it needs to have uh, a set of rules that is consistent and that is actually enforced. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for those comments, Cedric. Um, before I uh, turn it over to Professor Hong, uh, let me just make a procedural note for our audience. If you would like to pose a question to our panelists, uh, there's a button down at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. I invite you to type in your question there. Uh, I will see that. And then as the moderator, I will curate that. And I can't promise we will get to your question, but uh, we will definitely see that. And I will attempt, if time allows, to pose your question to the, the panelists. So please do feel free to uh, pose a question through the Q&A. Uh, so second, we'll have uh, Professor Hong from uh, National Taiwan University. Thank you. Um, good afternoon um, there. And um, from my viewpoint, it is a very difficult decision for the NCC because it <laughs> suffered a lot of uh, pressure inside and outside of the country. Um, first of all, I, I want to say that to my knowledge, the NCC rejected the uh, CT TV news license renewal application on the grounds that uh, the channel frequently violate media regulation. So on the ground, um, I, I uh, share the same viewpoint with uh, Sarah here. And the records show that um, Zhongtian has a male functional in internal control mm. mechanism that cannot be ratified. And its future operation plan was not very promising in terms of producing quality news. According to the law in Taiwan, a news channel can be fined if it violates the principle of verifying the truth and harms the public interest. In the worst situation, the regulator can maybe um, suspend the program or even uh, revoke it, the license immediately. So that's uh, you know, the regulation by our law. Then let's turn to um, the case for the uh, CTTV news. Um, there's one um, more 
things we need to know that um, six years ago in year 2014, this news channel um, was in the process of uh, you know, renew as broadcasting license. And it was given requirements for its license re renewal. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, everyone here should know that that's under the KMT administration. Mm -hmm. So um, according to the Satellite Broadcasting Act, channel operators should obtain a license from the regulator, the NCC, and renew it every six years. And back to that time, the external committee, uh, which you know the regulator invited, helped them to review you know the um, conduct of you know each uh, channel for their license renewal, and it got this uh, you know disagreement with the external um, com com committee. That that's the uh, situation there. But uh, eventually the NCC um, um, agreed to renew the license. Um, but they, um, they required you know, uh, Zhongtian to enhance their internal quality control mechanism. So here again, after six years, the NCC um, review um, the you know, the conduct of the uh, news channel and find it, you know, the situation got worse. Mm -hmm. So they have to, they have to take for the step to, you know, uh, to ask, you know, the, the news channel to do more things. So that's what happened in last year, as we um, already know. But uh, what happened, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, the, the news channel has shown to the, you know, Taiwan, Taiwanese audience and even, you know, to the whole world. Um, they, they sent a strong message that um, they maybe just as uh, Abdian said that many um, people think that, it thinks that uh, Chongtian um, TV is not a news channel. Instead, it's a propaganda, you know, tools for the mainland China. So let's be concerned uh, in in Taiwan. And back to um, the conduct of uh, the news channel, according to the record of um, the NCC. Yeah, they uh, have violated a lot of, you know, um, uh, regulations and they got fined uh, by the regulators. Um, in total, by the end of 2020, CTTV has been fined a total of um, uh, more than 11 million uh, Taiwanese dollars. Uh, maybe it's not the big, Amount in you know the US is, uh, but uh, it's big amount in Taiwan, and it's for twenty five breaches of media regulations, and the amount is you know more significant than other news channels. So talking about media freedom, you know the main um, issues here are, uh, uh, Karis just uh, mentioned. As a democratic country, Taiwan enjoys a high level of media freedom in global rankings. And there are many news outlets in this island country and show diversity in their news selection and viewpoints. However, uh, severe competition has a negative influence because there is pressure to cut cost in um, news production that lead to less investigative reporting, reduce the coverage of uh, public issues, less fact checking, less international news, and you know uh, too much quiet news and too much news coming from online resources. 
So Taiwanese people are dis um, dissatisfied with the quality of the media. So um, I think um, that's why uh, the NCC has to um, take the um, more active, you know, uh, measures to, to regulate uh, the TV news. And, and of course, I, um, I agree with uh, the uh, viewpoint that the regulators should, uh, you know, have um, the uh, consistency in law enforcement in the, uh, in the future. And actually, uh, some people might ask that uh, um, it's, a, it's a political because uh, the NCC only punished, you know, the pan blue or pro-China media. But actually, it's not true. If you um, uh, look through the record of the NCC in the past uh, two or three years, actually the um, the pan green um, TV stations um, such as the uh, um, SCT or you know other former SAR TV, they also got fined from uh, the regulator and they but. Uh, uh, we should say and we should tell to what extent, you know, the uh, TV news um, conduct and uh, to what extent uh, they uh, violated the, the law and the principle. And we have to ask, you know, uh, they really uh, qualified, you know, to serve the public interest or are they really qualified to, you know, uh, or see to uh, renew the license. If we uh, put the question, actually that, uh, you know, that's a group of people in Taiwan ask, if the NCC continue to give license to this kind of new station, how can they say they um, do their job to serve the goal of our media regulation and serve the public interest. Mm. So, well, yeah, I think that's my uh, basic uh, viewpoint on seeing this case and uh, on um, press freedom in Taiwan. So maybe in the next section, um, we can you know, talk more yeah, regarding the uh, questions from the audience. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Professor Hong. Um, our third panelist is Eric Huang. Uh, Eric, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you, Karis. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this panel with um, two well, experts. Um, I'm not a journalistic expert, but I'm here to offer my observations. Um, I'm here to make a three-prong argument in favor of CPI TV. Uh, against uh, the NCC uh, deploying it. The first argument is uh, a, an old and tested argument that in the interest of democracy, we need to protect diverse opinions and to promote civic dialogue. Zhongtian uh, um, is a platform enjoyed by a lot of Taiwanese and that offers a viewpoint, uh, many might argue as being pro-China, but it's shared uh, with by uh, many of the Taiwanese. The second is that uh, though I'm not, um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert and I don't have expertise to argue whether NCC has the authority to revoke the license, but I think NCC might not have met the substantive due process to actually not renewing Zhongtian's uh, um, uh, news license. Third is I would like to address the white elephant in the room that is from a national security standpoint, that shouldn't be the reason and it actually wasn't the reason for NCC to not renew Zhongtian's uh, license. So uh, given we all know that the CCP is a threat, China is a threat and China tries to penetrate Taiwan society through different media channels. I personally uh, have criticized the CCP on numerous occasions whenever I appear on Zhongtian, either on their news channels or their political talk shows. Uh, this is not to say I'm biased. 
Um, so allow me to uh, dive deeper into my three points. I think the concept of public sphere is to allow mass media to function as an exchange for different and all ideas and perspectives. Um, this is true um, in Taiwan that we have many different viewpoints for our audiences. So um, if you find Zhong Tian's um, news reporting to be, um, um, uh, to be biased or to be not correct, I think the audience can find other news channels to balance the facts. And this is uh, not to mention that uh, new, uh, the news reproduced by Zhong Tian, um, even though um, have selection biases, but um, there isn't really a lot of factual mistakes. I, I will go into this point further uh, later. Um, second, I think the erosion of tolerance in speech um, in the worldwide phenomenon needs to be taken with caveat. Um, I think nowadays, um, because of online information and disinformation everywhere, people are aware of this situation um, but according to FCC, which is equivalent to Taiwan's NCC, they do not review anyone's qualification to either edit or announce or comment on the news. So I think this is very, we need to be very careful to go down this road, especially um, even though I'm not arguing the case, but I'm saying such actions can easily um, be read or misread as politically motivated, or uh, the people who um, actually just you know pure audience who enjoy uh, either news station in this case Zhong Tian might feel like their their ostracized or you know their viewpoints are being uh, censored by the government. Uh, further, um, in the case of news distortion, which often are being complained and filed against in the United States um, for either inaccuracy or one-sided news, or in this case, which is very relevant to the Zhongtian uh, scenario, uh, scenario, which is overly dramatized on certain politicians, MCC usually will not intervene based on its First Amendment protections, which they argue that they will not replace their generalistic judgment thereof onto any new stations with FCC's own. Um, I think this view is consistent in the 2018 case where FCC ignored then President Trump's tweet um, in favor to revoke NBC station broadcast license. Um, Again, uh, I'm not here to go into the generalistic ethic, which I'm not an expert. I'm just simply sharing my view here. So let's talk more about Zhong Tian's case. It is to the best of my knowledge, in the past six years, which is the, 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 the period they were under observation, um, they had 25 violations handed down by the NCC. Zero occur between 2014 to 2018. So all 25 cases happened between 2018 and 2020. This two years period coincide with Taiwan's two elections, um, domestic and presidential. So uh, out of these 25 cases, I will mention 18 of them, not in detail. So seven of which the violation were handed down to Zhong Tian's political talk shows. So here, I guess, even though this is a new station, but you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can argue the case that, you know, uh, commentators or pundits or experts are offering their political opinions. 11 cases are cited for overly dr dramatic coverage of a particular politician and, this politician often is what Harris said in the beginning of our seminar, Han Guoyu, uh, who is a pro-China um, politician in Taiwan. Some might argue that he's pro-CCP, even though I argue that's not the case. Um, in these cases, 
all of we, which if you read through the details, many, uh, many audiences in Taiwan or the citizens will feel the political ramification of this. Um, I will first argue the case that even though uh, national security shouldn't take part of our conversation here, A, national security, if national security is an issue at hand, um, different set of legal action should be taken um, rather than um, actions against the news agency's license being revoked or not, in this case, not being revoked, just not being renewed. Um, so many Taiwanese enjoy Jinkin's uh, news reporting. Actually, during the period of 2018 and 2019, it is actually the most watched news station in Taiwan. So I will further argue the case that Zhongtian is not a pro-CCP agent. CCP Chinese Communist agent It is just within Taiwan, a pro-China and pro um, prostrate peaceful solution station, which shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be taking actions against political. So though I think um, this whole case is not politically motivated, but the discussion, the civic discussion has led to that uh, discourse. So um, many people might even argue the case that if you watch other news stations in Taiwan, um, some of the phenomenon even that I feel concerning from Zhongtian is also happening. And it's very easy to go down the road for people to say in already diverse political society to say there is a double standard here. Um, even though I'm arguing that um, NCC shouldn't not renew or revoke any new station. And I think that's why that the bulk of my argument that Zhongtian situation uh, is bad for Taiwan society. Um, there isn't any concrete evidence that I have seen yet that Beijing has news editorial and therefore I think that is not a reason for NCC to reject its license renewal. So um, very briefly I'll recap my entire argument is that for the interest of democratic interest and for the evidence we have seen from NCC and the evidence we have seen from the Beijing's interference all fail to meet the standard of the action and the result we see here. And I will rest the rest of my time and I welcome um, an open discussion. Okay, great. Um, thank you all for those uh, very lucid and uh, informative remarks. Um, I'd like to go ahead and turn now to kind of an open discussion. Uh, and the first question I wanna pose to the group, if I can find it here. Um, I'm, I'm struck by Cedric's comment that there's a, a clear distinction between news reporting and opinion. And in Taiwan, these lines uh, are constantly blurred. Uh, you'll have a, a, a news report on a television station followed by a talk show, uh, and the same people are sometimes involved in both. Uh, and so I'm, I'm I'd like to invite the three panelists to uh, perhaps reflect on how we can distinguish between reporting that is strictly news in which there's no, um, there's no kind of partisan slant or there's no kind of bias or, or at least we can enforce uh, a neutral nonpartisan approach to news reporting uh, and opinion where we wanna see different points of political view. We wanna see a robust debate among uh, different voices. And so um, can we make this distinction and can we ask a government body actually to enforce that in a way that's actually practical? Um, and so this is a, a question I think that Cedric probably should tackle first uh, and then we'll go in order again. Thank you, yes. There's, there's a point um, in, mentioned by Eric Huang uh, on, on which I totally agree. There's others uh, for which I, I quite disagree. Uh, Right, we are not talking about freedom of opinions, we're talking about news, meaning facts. And the problem is that uh, 
not even mentioning about Beijing's interference, which Eric is right, uh, can, can very hardly be, be proven. But the owner of the TV channel CTI, uh, Tsai Hongman, has been caught. We're talking you just about. Froze. Like, Sorry, can you repeat yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, we're not talking about uh, uh, political biases. We're talking about deliberate lies. And this is very dangerous for democracy. The very purpose of a regulator is to make sure that news channels are imparting news content, meaning factual content, maybe comments, but not a, a fact that would not exist. And it's not because, and it's true, the, the media in Taiwan, uh, most of them uh, do, do not work fully ethical. It's not because everyone violates the rules, so no one should be sanctioned. It doesn't work like this. CTI may be the first one, but it would be good actually for the Taiwanese democracy that other channels uh, of other poli uh, uh, political, uh, with other political tendencies would also be sanctioned for the same thing. And we are calling on NCC to apply the same standards to all channels. Information in Taiwan has become some kind of a mix between entertainment and circus games. This is not tolerable in a democracy. Uh, the news should be a tool for the public to better participate in democracy. And it's normal that a regulatory body would enforce it. And my last point, uh, it is very important and we're calling on the government to uh, reinforce the guarantees of independence of NCC, just like they should do for public broadcasters. Because of course, you mentioned it, Karin, in the beginning of our discussion, as long as there will be doubt on uh, the independence of NCC members, there will be doubt on NCC decisions, and it will be also bad for the Taiwanese democracy in general. So all this is in the past two open letters published by Reporters Without Borders. First one was published before the presidential election at the end of uh, 2089. And the second one was published last year in May, and we were calling on President Tsai to act on these matters. Guarantees of independence of NCC and the public broadcasters are fundamental. Okay, uh, so if I understand you right, Cedric, you're calling for a much more robust media regulator in Taiwan, which would be a, a distinct shift from the traditional practices in Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, Every, every um, sector is regulated. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Why the media should be the only sector that is not uh, regulated and that is outside of democratic control? This okay. uh, makes no sense in a democracy. Okay, uh, Jun Ling, since you have experience working as part of that media regulator, uh, do you think that's practical? Um, thank you. Um, I think uh, the NCC um, actually, you know, uh, the law uh, enforcement is uh, exactly follow the law. And I don't agree with the, you know, uh, er what Eric just say as a um, double standards because uh, by, you know, the satellite broadcasting TV Act, um, the NCC can only, you know, um, enforce financial um, penalty whenever, you know, the news channel um, uh, they, um, they didn't really verify the truth, you know, of news stories before broadcasting it. So there's nothing relevant to you know the opinions or the viewpoint, which pro China or against China. So that's not the uh, the issue and the the rationale for the NCC to um, you know to um, sanction on CTTV or other news channels. So I have to make this point very clearly. And uh, Eric just mentioned that uh, um, the 
um, you know, the penalties uh, happened in the past two years, uh, around the year 2018 and 2020. But there's uh, one missing point because um, the amendment of the um, TV Act, which was passed by the Congress of Taiwan in year 2015, and the NCC started to, you know, um, enforce the law requirement uh, around the, you know, year 2018. So that's the real situation. So you cannot argue that the why, you know, before uh, year 2016 or 2015, there's no any case in Taiwan about, you know, to punish the news channel for, you know, um, their ignorance of verifying the truth. So that's the you know uh, law amendment um, uh, in Taiwan. So we have to uh, make this uh, point very clearly to the audience. So let's back to um, the point uh, of the law requirement. And maybe I want to um, jump you know out of the box of the situation and the political tension inside Taiwan from the comparative uh, policy viewpoint. I have to say that the NCC in Taiwan, we uh, quite uh, followed the um, FCC model in the United States, but our law enforcement and the requirement are more similar to the European model. For example, I want to um, put the UK's case um, on the text. Um, the regulator of COM in the UK, they, you know, they frequently, <laughs> you know, um, punish the news channels on the issues such as, you know, uh, impartiality, fairness and uh, um, correctly, the, um, uh, accuracy, this kind of issues. There are two major cases in the last year. One is Russia today. Mm. Yeah, the Ofcom um, started the investigation of some news program of Russia today, especially on the spy issue, you know. <laughs> and they, the result of the investigation is that they find the Russia today violate uh, of comes broadcasting act on impartiality and uh, accuracy. And the second case is about the CGTN. Uh, I think most of audience here know what CGTN is. Um, the former, um, you know, is the CCTV. So um, the major case here is that the CGTN's new story and the coverage on Hong Kong protest is found by the Ofcom. Um, you know, um, violating the Broadcasting Act. So the Ofcom find um, these two, you know, um, video, uh, news televisions, and eventually Ofcom revoked CGT and TV license after, you know, the investigation. Immediately, not, you know, <laughs> after certain terms of uh, license re renewal. So that's um, um, the um, regulation system in uh, the UK. So if we um, look into uh, this kind of media, re uh, media regulation from the global, you know, global um, um, world, so we, we cannot deny that, you know, the UK is democratic country, and we cannot argue that it, you know, it um, violates uh, or um, uh, invasion of uh, press freedom here. Okay, um, so we've got 
it sounds like two votes then for a more robust uh, and active media regulator in Taiwan and one that uh, is going to enforce uh, ideally would enforce uh, more directly and consistently um, uh, some professional nonpartisan journalistic standards. Uh, Eric, do you think that's possible? Um, and is there a way in your mind to distinguish between opinion news uh, or uh, editorial and actual uh, news news where, where they're just broadcasting the facts? And just to clarify, I wasn't arguing there is a double standard. I'm saying the perception, the public perception, perceived as a double, double standard. I wasn't arguing their way. Um, so let me offer, let me offer uh, my thoughts on your question first. Um, I think that given today's you know, fast uh, information technology era, I think it's very hard for people to not receive misinformation in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. So the question, to address this question, we really have to look at um, two issues. One issue is whether NCC has the authority to oversee um, a new channel using a, a, a public platform. The second is, does the government has the authority to shut down a self media, say what Zhongtian does today, which is on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. The latter, um, in my opinion, is easier to answer uh, is no, I don't think the government would have that authority. The former is more tricky. And um, for, for a person like me coming from a political background, I'm simply pointing out the fact that um, even when we are discussing um, a journalistic ethic issues, we still have to face the reality of public perception. And that's often um, very tricky and something that's very important to mend and move a society forward, um, especially given uh, the rise of political populism and the, the, the divisiveness of Taiwan's politics, even though I think we are, we might be a little better than the US in that front, but that's just my opinion. Um, so um, this Zhongtian case, what this Zhongtian case proved to us is if this Zhongtian case can help other Taiwanese news media using a public platform to become more A, objective, and B, more journalistically ethical, and I think is a good direction. But I'm still pointing out the fact that there are um, in between the times of the next NCC review of new stations, there are a lot of um, unanswered questions remain in the public discourse. And I think this is actually bad for society and democracy. Okay, great. Um, so in the interest of time, I wanna move on to another question. Um, and I, I, I'll just make the observation that in Taiwan, the NCC has jurisdiction over uh, broadcast media, so television and radio, but it does not have jurisdiction over print media, as I understand it. And it does not have jurisdiction over the internet. Right uh, or social media companies, which in fact are private companies that regulate themselves. And so in the United States, we've run into this problem where the social media companies are struggling to figure out how to police uh, unethical behavior on their platforms and to define a kind of ethical standard. And so uh, the question I'd pose to all of our panelists is, is there something special about TV that necessitates or justifies a more kind of aggressive or robust regulatory presence that uh, is not so crucial or important in the print media sphere or online in the internet. And if, uh, if you think there's not a difference, then are, would you advocate then for Taiwan to create some, some kind of regulatory body that also regulates print and internet media? Um, so we'll start with Cedric. Yes. Yeah. That, that's an excellent question. Well, the TV is very important because uh, it's likely to be the, the media that has the most impact and the most uh, immediate impact on the uh, high, largest number uh, 
of members of the public. But I believe that these regulatory questions actually come from technical uh, facts, because in the past, uh, there were a very limited number of channels, and these channels had to be uh, attributed and there were a lot of technical questions so there is a history between the fact that uh, the tv would be regulated another way compared to internet uh, or to the print media um, nowadays uh, there is no more difference of nature between the media uh, and of course, there should be a unified regulation because the same company might operate TV channel, TV channel over the web, radio channel, uh, radio channel over the web, print media, print media over the web. So of course, uh, there should be one single and unified regulation. Uh, this leads to a wider question. Uh, after the, the cyberspace, uh, got opened, uh, democracies are not in control anymore. Uh, democracies have a hard time to protect themselves against propaganda, uh, against authoritarian regimes that somehow invade this cyberspace because regulations most of the times are outdated. Uh, and this is not a threat that only Taiwan is facing, but every democracy is facing this threat. And Reporters Without Borders is, has been repeatedly calling on democracies to sharpen their tools, improve the tools uh, to protect themselves uh, against such attacks. So in the case of Taiwan, yes, there should be a unified regulation not to control the media the print media, the TV, the internet, but to ensure that there is a fair rule of the game that benefits to the public. Okay, um, I, I'm going to go to our next two panelists, but I do want to raise a, a related issue here, and that is in the print media sphere and in the online sphere in Taiwan in practice, the enforcement of ethics is basically through the uh, defamation and libel laws. Uh, so different media companies will sue reporters and reporters then face a lawsuit for some of their reporting, even if they can demonstrate that that reporting was in fact factual. And I bring this up in part because this is directly related to the CTI TV case. There was a reporter in uh, the summer of 2019, Catherine Hill, who wrote an article for Financial Times um, getting several people, anonymous sources, but several anonymous sources to uh, conclude that uh, CTI TV and the larger China Times Want Want group were coordinating their coverage with the Taiwan Affairs Office in Beijing. Uh, and that ran then in the Financial Times and Want Want group then turned around and sued the reporter, Catherine Hill. Um, I mention this in part because I wanted to have Catherine here as part of this conversation. And at the time I reached out to her, she was still under that lawsuit and could not speak publicly about it. That to me is a very concerning uh, case. And it suggests that uh, reporters in Taiwan do not actually have complete freedom to report even when they stand by their reporting, this threat hangs over them. And so, um, is there another way? Do, do Taiwan's libel laws need to change as well in order to preserve media freedom in Taiwan? So, Jun Ling, uh, you're, you're an expert on journalism uh, in Taiwan. Uh, how, what do you think of this case? Okay, um, thank you for uh, mentioning this case. Yeah, talking about the uh, libel law. Yeah, currently in Taiwan, yeah, we still have, you know, the libel. Um, uh, punishment uh, by the criminal uh, law. So that's the current situation. And let's continue debate in Taiwan here, especially, you know, the uh, journalist association and the media reform um, organizations uh, quite uh, propose this issue. And yeah, I think that's one thing we should to um, think and act more, you know, carefully uh, in Taiwan here. And talking about, uh, you know, the difference of regulation for uh, print media, broadcasting media, and uh, even the internet. 
um, I think the uh, international trend of regulation is kind of changing nowadays, especially for the internet. So it happens in the United States, in the European countries. Uh, for example, the uh, EU, they have uh, the uh, AVNSD, that's audio video um, media service directive. It already, you know, includes the online services and to put the same regulation, you know, uh, standard for broadcasting media and online media, even, you know, including social media, but not the print media. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's the global challenge for especially, you know, the media regulator and the democ uh, democratic country, you know, in regulation, um, the media outlets. But I think we all hit the same, same uh, bump in the internet tubes or whatever. Um, all right, uh, sorry about that. Let's return to Jun Ling. You were making a point about uh, the media service directive in the EU and and more generally yeah. kind of trends in international uh, international trends in media regulation. Um, That's right. So yeah, my point here that's the challenge you know globally for every democratic country to um, deal with you know the such as misinformation or disinformation online. Right. And of course, that's the current, you know, efforts for Taiwanese government and for the civil society in Taiwan. Yeah, I just working on, you know, the report about the combating uh, misinformation in Taiwan. And I found it's, um, the key here is uh, cross-sector cooperation. Mm. among different, you know, the government, uh, the media industry, the online platform and the civil society, and even including fact check organizations. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and currently Taiwan stands well, you know, because we have um, a small, uh, presidential election in year 2020 and we are doing very well on the pan, you know uh, pandemic of covid-19 yeah. so we hope that yeah we we need more efforts and more communications with the civil society not only the decision you know and policy made by the government right Right, so there is an important role for civil society to play and potentially uh, a journalistic uh, group as well um, that would self-police. Uh, in many countries, journalists themselves go through a kind of professionalization or training. They, uh, they censor each other if, or, or censure, sorry, each other uh, if they engage in malpractice. Uh, and so there's a fair amount of civil society work that could be done to improve Taiwan's media environment as well. Um, Eric, I, I wanna hear from you about uh, the possibility of, uh, I noticed you were nodding along when, when we were talking about libel laws in Taiwan and, and concern about that. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on this? Right, so for the interest of time, I'll keep my answer very short. I think um, since I'm arguing that for media freedom, I think A, we should get rid of this B, libel laws against individual journalists. And second, uh, we should just apply the same regulations across board for all media and news agencies, whether it's broadcasting, newspaper, or in the internet. Okay. I'm in favor of less re regulations um, uh, versus strict regulations. But um, like uh, Cedric and Professor Holmes said, the world is facing a new phenomenon and people are still figuring out what to do. So for that, I will also listen to experts like them um, for their discussions to see what's the best way forward. I want to uh, kind of close our discussion here with a thought about uh, the commercial motive in media 
in Taiwan, but elsewhere as well. In the United States, we've seen a dramatic decline in the quality and the kind of robustness of local news reporting uh, because much of their ad revenue has been stripped away by um, the large social media companies. Um, in Taiwan, profit margins at most of the media companies are extremely thin, as I understand it. And so there's a, a rush to put out product cheaply and quickly. Um, and uh, so one proposal that's been floating around for 20 or 25 years in Taiwan is to create a more robust public broadcasting system. So there is a public broadcasting station. I don't know how many people actually watch it these days, um, but is there... Uh, do you think that might help improve the overall media sphere in Taiwan if you had a more robust public uh, television and public radio and perhaps even some public print media and online media? Uh, is there a, 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 a strong rationale for building this up, investing some resources in it? Cedric, your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. This, this is one request uh, by Reporters Without Borders that the Taiwanese government would drastically increase the funding of the public media. Let's make it clear, public media does not mean state media. Uh, state media in an authoritarian country is a media uh, that answers to the state, that uh, carries the propaganda of the state. When we're talking about public media, we're talking about media that belong to the public, meaning that are not submitted to the imperative of uh, making profit for shareholders so that can make a better public service for the uh, information of citizens. We should actually call them public service media that would be uh, more clear. So in Taiwan, the public service media are uh, extremely underfunded uh, the budget of the public television service, for example, is only a fraction of its uh, South Korean counterpart. I think it represents something like 6%, if uh, I have a good memory, of the uh, South Korean uh, uh, TV budget. So even if you consider the difference of population, uh, PTS is extremely underfunded. And of course, the purpose of a strong public TV system is to set standards. You cannot expect private companies which purpose is to make profit to set ethical standards if they do not have uh, competition. Uh, so th this, this is very important that uh, Taiwan would uh, strengthen its public TV sector. It should be the reference. It should be the public, the, the public TV should be the TV the public refers to in case of doubt, in case of doubt on contents being published. And for this, not only public TV service needs more money, uh, I'm, I'm talking about PTS, but I could talk about the, the press agency, I could talk about uh, the public radio and so on. Uh, not only they need more money, but they also need better guarantees of independence. Because, of course, as long as there would be a suspicion that government is able in any way to have control on their editorial line, the public trust in these media will not uh, improve. So more money and more guarantees of independence, this is capital for the future of the Taiwanese democracy. Okay. Uh, Junling, your thoughts on this? Uh, we'll give you about a minute and a half uh, since we're running short on time. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, I support the public uh, media system, especially we have very, very strong public television station here and the annual budget is uh, 900 million uh, Taiwanese dollar. It's uh, just uh, about uh, 30, uh, 30 million US dollars. That's really small money. And without uh, you know, uh, the full um, support from the public, uh, yeah, we cannot have a you know, sound um, TV system here and to put a good uh, model for the commercial media. So, of course, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Eric, uh, some last words, last thoughts? Sure. I'm in favor of a stronger uh, public-supported uh, news outlet, but I think there that cannot 
be in substitution for more commercial driven uh, right. news media. That is to argue we um, the case that that's why public you know, news outlets are even more important and needed. I think there will always be different opinions and there will be new stations that share different views. Great. Uh, well, we have uh, like 30 seconds left in this event. So I just want to extend a, a warm thanks uh, to our three panelists for getting up early Taipei time to join us today for this conversation. As you can see, we've got a lot of issues that we just began to scratch the surface of. And uh, I hope we can continue this conversation in person sometime soon when uh, we can travel again and, and get together in Taiwan. But um, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Uh, at, just to remind our viewing audience, I'm Karis Templeman. I'm the program manager of the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region at the Hoover Institution. And this has been Defending Media Freedom in Taiwan. Thanks. Uh, have a good morning, good rest of the day, good night, wherever you may be, and stay safe out there. Mm -hmm.